Hi everyone, welcome back to another episode in the Nico the Vet channel. Uh, today's subject, I thought we might tackle hyperthyroidism in cats. So hyperthyroidism means an overactive thyroid. So just on a, on a point of semantics and just to be a little bit pedantic, uh, people sometimes say that cat, my cat's hypothyroid when they mean hyperthyroid. So what's the difference? Hypo means underactive and hyper means overactive. So specifically with reference to the thyroid, um, if we look at uh, thyroid problems in the various species, in human beings and in dogs, our most common thyroid malfunction is hypothyroidism, underactive thyroid. And in cats, the most common thyroid dysfunction is the opposite, which is hyperthyroid, which is too uh, too, an over, too much production of thyroid hormone, hormone or an over uh, um, stimulation of the thyroid hormones. So just rewind a little bit if we consider the problem. What are the thyroid glands? We, we all have uh, two thyroid glands and they sit in your neck. If I show you my neck, uh, uh, going down from your throat, you've got your voice box about there. And then just below your voice box uh, uh, on either side, you've got a thyroid gland. So there'll be one there and there'll be one there on either side uh, uh, on your throat or on either side of your windpipe, just below the voice box. Now, ordinarily, these should be so small in cats that we just can't feel them generally. So what, as vets, we slide our hands down what's called the jugular groove here. That's what clearly named the jugular groove because the jugular lives in that groove, but the thyroid lives in that groove too. And even if you can't feel a lump just below the voice box, we'll slide our finger down like that. And if there is an overactive thyroid, as we go over it, it boings, it sort of pops up at us. So there's the thyroid, run our hand down and it goes pop. So you get that sort of thyroid popping effect. So ordinarily though, they're much too small to feel. So what is the job of the thyroid? Just to completely oversimplify it, it produces thyroid hormone. And what does the thyroid hormone do? It controls your, your basic metabolic rate. So your metabolic rate is sort of just the rate that every single cell and every single organ in your body is ticking over at. So, uh, to, so, so to make sense of that, think of uh, people who are naturally slim and they eat whatever they like. We, we hate those people, um, um, but what's working in their favor is they probably have a very high natural uh, thyroid rate. So they're not abnormal, they're not hyperthyroid. There is a range of what's considered to be a normal thyroid level. These people are probably right at the top of the range. And that means that every cell in their body is ticking over just at a very fast, slightly faster rate, it's just working a little bit faster, a little bit quicker. And to do that, it needs to burn a lot more energy, which is why these people eat whatever they like and stay slim. Whereas if you uh, uh, have an underactive thyroid, then your whole body is sluggish because every single individual cell and organ is a little bit sluggish and is working a little bit slower. And that means um, you, you, you are not burning anywhere near as much energy uh, uh, as someone with, with a, a sort of a higher thyroid function. And again, you may still be in the normal range, you're just near the sluggish end. Um, and these are the people, for example, who are careful what they eat, but they gain weight very, very easily. Uh, and we empathize with those people, <laughs> which is the opposite of the, of the high thyroid level people. Um, so, um, so in cats, if they develop hyperthyroidism, it's a condition that we, we almost certainly wouldn't see in, in, a, in a young cat. They, they're documented, but they're very rare. It's usually a 10 year old plus cat where we'd expect to see this problem. And the classic presentation is people will come into me and say, my cat is as skinny as a rake. They, they're very, very thin. They eat vast amounts of food, often six, seven, eight, nine sachets of cat food a day, in addition to the ad lib dry food that I'm putting down. So they're eating voraciously, they're staying very, very skinny. They sometimes, if people are astute, will notice that the cats are not necessarily hyperactive or overactive, but they're just sort of, they're busy. They're not, these, these are generally not sick cats that are lying around. They're busy, they're, they're, they're on the go all the time. Uh, uh, if anything, they're a little bit agitated. Uh, so if you try and give them a fuss or sort of hold them or restrict them, they get agitated uh, very easily, sort of a, leave me alone. Uh, and some of them may also present with vomiting. But fundamentally, you've got quite a well cat, just eating loads and very, very skinny. Yes, you do get the one in a thousand case, uh, uh, where, which we would describe as being thyroid toxic. So their thyroid, excess thyroid level is so high that it's actually toxic to them and they feel rubbish. So they, they're not eating, they're losing weight, they're miserable, lethargic. Sort of the opposite of what you would expect. 
with the usual packages, skinny cat, eating loads, uh, still very active, very happy, got a lot to say, vocalizes a lot, uh, uh, and if anything, a little bit agitated, and maybe vomiting. So if you suspect this is happening, take them off to your, 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 um, to your vets and get them checked out. The vet will have to do some testing to confirm that that is in fact the diagnosis. By testing, I mean blood tests. And at the same time, we would screen for other things which may look similar-ish. Uh, uh, for example, diabetes, which is going to make you um, um, uh, hungry and thirsty and potentially lose weight. So uh, there's a separate talk on that if you're interested in accessing that. So, so let's assume you've been to your vet and they've had a look at your cat and they've diagnosed them as hyperthyroid. Um, one of the things that prompts me to think that uh, and, 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 um, and run the test is uh, everything we've described, which is the skinny cat eating loads, but fundamentally a, a well cat. Uh, and I'll have a quick listen to their heart. If, if their heart is, is, is beating at over about 200 beats a minute, I'm very, very suspicious that you either have a primary heart problem or very likely um, an overactive thyroid, and that would prompt me again to want to, to do the test, because why is the heart going fast? Because remember, we said the thyroid controls your basic metabolic rate. So everything is just going faster in these guys, the heart uh, included. Um, um, so we do the test, let's say, and we confirm that A, you uh, do in fact have an overactive thyroid, and B, there's no other pathology going on. Nothing else, nothing else wrong with you at the same time. And it's important to check for that in your sort of 10 plus year old cats, because just like us, as we get older, we often have comorbidities, meaning there's more than one thing uh, wrong with us. So, um, so uh, apart from everything else we've discussed, how are these cats feeling? They, it's, it's an unpleasant feeling. If you speak, speak to people who've ever had an overactive thyroid, they'll tell you there's a, a headachey, uh, uh, um, agitated, frustrated sensation to them. And, and that's because often this condition can be associated with high blood pressure. Again, something your vet can check for you. Um, and it's important to address this high blood pressure because high blood pressure is an extremely unpleasant way to live. And in cats, one of the big complications we can see of uh, high blood pressure is that the retinas, which is the bit inside your eyeball, right at the, so the bit right at the back of your eyeball that um, the light hits and that creates the visual image that goes to our brain, they can develop retinal detachment as a complication of hyperthyroidism. So many reasons to want to treat this, because if you suffer retinal detachment, you are blind, and usually in cats, that's it, you're blind forever. So we want to treat this to protect you against going blind, um, um, to protect you against just permanent ongoing weight loss, to protect you against just feeling rubbish all the time uh, and feeling uh, um, significantly agitated and uh, unwell. So you've done the test, you've figured out there's nothing else going on, you, now you want to treat your cat. What are the options? So the traditional options were uh, uh, first of all, medical treatment, which is to say, give your cats uh, tablets. Uh, the, the fundamental basic forms of the tablets are methimazole and carbimazole. Think of them really just as drugs that go in and they slow down your thyroid. So you take this hyperactive thyroid, this runaway overactive thyroid, and we slow it down. Now there is no magic dose. There's no, this, this is, there's no, it's not a matter of a one size fits all, or even this is the dose that will work for your cat because they're this size. We have a starting point with these tablets. They, some, some of them are once a day, some of them are twice a day dosing. Um, so we give these cab the cats these tablets for about three weeks and then we get them back and retest them. And we want to test two things when we retest them. First of all, have we brought your thyroid, your high thyroid level back down into the normal range? Remember that we said there's a range and we'd want to be uh, in the middle of the range and ideally even in the lower half of the range to confirm that we're controlling you well. And you need the blood test to, to tell you this. But also what you want to know is, have, uh, uh, has the act of controlling the overactive thyroid revealed that you actually also have a kidney problem at the same time? So why didn't we pick that up on the initial test before we treated you? Uh, and that's because uh, again, because you've got the overactive thyroid, everything is working much harder and much faster. And um, one of those things is the heart. Like we said, the heart's going often in excess of 200 beats a minute. Really 120 is, is, is normal. Um, so now you're going at 200 beats a minute. That's bad for the heart because the poor old heart is just this pump and it's frantically pumping away uh, and it's pumping lots more blood around the body at a much faster rate than it would ordinarily. So that's bad for the heart. It's bad for the pump because the pump is working much harder. But it's good for the kidneys because the kidneys are very 
uh, greedy organs. They want a very high blood supply because with the blood supply comes obviously a lot of a lot of oxygen, a lot of glucose to help them function, and it lets them work better because they're just bringing more toxins to them faster and helping them filter out the toxins from the body quicker. So, so the overactive thyroid effect of getting the heart to go much faster is bad for the heart, but good for the kidneys. So you could have kidneys that aren't quite the full ticket, but because you've got the overactive thyroid at the same time, and you're getting a much higher blood supply to the kidneys than is normal, that may actually be propping up the kidneys, as it were. So there's kidneys are actually failing due to old age, um, um, but, you, but you haven't picked that up on the first test because there's an abnormal situation where they're getting much more blood supply than they would ordinarily, which is effectively propping them up. So now you come to your... Uh, three weeks or four weeks since you started the treatment, you rerun the tests and you go, right, my thyroid is, is where I want it. We also want to look at the kidney enzymes because sometimes, like I say, you can then, when, you, when you've restored the normal balance, so you no, are now giving a normal amount of blood supply to the kidneys, um, you may well find that the kidneys are then not working as well as, they, as, as we thought. So what does this mean? Does this mean uh, we need to uh, uh, um, change, or, uh, change our plan? And the thinking on this has evolved. The original thinking was, okay, maybe we have to reach a compromise. So we treat the thyroid, we slow the heart rate down, so we're taking a bit of strain off the heart, um, which means it's still overactive, but it's not quite as frantically overactive as it was, and that's giving more blood to the kidneys and propping up the kidneys. That must be, that must be sort of a, a trade-off, really, that we are not taking the heart strain off the heart, but that's to not put an extra strain on the kidneys. The thinking on that has changed. If, pretty much, if, and that's come through research, if we treat the thyroid and we bring your thyroid level back down to normal, so that's important, it's in the normal range, even if your kidney enzymes have crept up a little bit, studies have shown that those individuals um, um, will live as long as the individuals whose kidney enzymes didn't creep up. And that's provided the thyroid is maintained or reduced back down to a normal range. If the treatment we apply drops the thyroid function below normal, so now that cat is hypothyroid with an underproduction of thyroid, if that has happened in conjunction with the kidney enzymes creeping up, which means the kidneys are, are, are the kidney failure has been exposed um, and and uh, uh, um, and, and unaddressed, uh, so if you then then you're going to have a problem. Then you're not going to live as long as as uh, you would have ordinarily. So just to clarify, I've made that sound a little more complicated than it was. If you control the thyroid and you bring the thyroid back into the normal range and your kidney enzymes creep up, which tell you your kidneys are not functioning as well as they were when you were a youngster, that is okay. But if your thyroid level has dropped below the normal level and your kidney enzymes have crept up, that is a problem. That is not okay. That will shorten your life. And then we have to adjust the thyroid control so that the thyroid level, meaning reduce the dose of the thyroid medication, so the level creeps back up into the normal range. And then if the kidney enzymes are up, we're not concerned. Um, you will live as long as, as if they hadn't crept up. So that's an important point to make. The second one is you can see from that that if you're going to use the medications, then you absolutely are committed to regular monitoring because once you're on thyroid medication, whether it's for an over or an underactive ther uh, uh, thyroid, you're not on the same dose forever. You may be fine and stabilized it as confirmed on a blood test today, um, but you need to regularly check it every sort of three, four, five, six months, depending on how stable you've proven yourself to be in the past, but it does need ongoing monitoring to check that we're not under or overdosing the thyroid as we go forward, even if we haven't changed the dosage of the, uh, of the tablets. Some people say to me, I don't want to subject my cat to that, um, or I don't want to spend that sort of money on that, or for whatever reason, it's just not going to happen. Uh, that doesn't mean you don't treat these cats at all. It means you just go on the clinical symptoms. And for me, that is, I treat a cat who now seems well, they're, they're not voracious anymore, their appetite seems normal, and they've gained a little bit of weight, uh, back to what we would consider to be a normal weight for them, and they're stable at that level, and their heart rate is no longer in excess of 200, it's nearer the 120 marks. So if your heart rate is normalized, your weight is normalized, your appetite is normalized, and you seem otherwise well, then, we can get away with it if someone is determined that for whatever reason that they do not want to use the blood test to do the monitoring but it is very much the poorer second cousin in terms of management of these guys so that's the traditional model you're basically committed to it forever you're committed to tableting your cat and you're committed to to testing uh, or at least monitoring to some extent 
Second option for these guys is surgical removal of the overactive thyroid or thyroids, because remember you have two. So it may just be one that's overactive or it may be both that's overactive. Um, and again, when we feel these guys, if you feel an enlarged thyroid, that, that is very probably overactive, not definitely. You need the blood test to confirm it because sometimes you can get enlarged ones which are not actually overproducing. They're just bigger than they should be. Um, so if we do decide to go for surgery, a couple of things to consider. Um, the first thing is that uh, attached to the thyroid on either side, just below your voice box, attached to the thyroid on the outside surface of the thyroid is another little gland called the parathyroid. And indeed, you actually have two parathyroids with each thyroid, one on the outside, one on the inside. So if we take the surgical option of saying we are going to remove the overactive thyroid gland, uh, either just the, the big one that's overactive on this side, or if both are, are big and enlarged and overactive, we'll remove both. What's very important is when we remove those, we must leave the parathyroid glands behind. So para, like I said, just means next to, and thyroid is thyroid. So the parathyroid is a little gland next to the thyroid. To create a, a, a visual mental image, Imagine your thyroid is sort of as big as, the large one is as big as the tip of my little finger. Um, and uh, from a surgical perspective, it's, it's quite nice in the sense that it's sort of a green color. So when you go in and you make your incision in amongst all the red stuff, there's this green bean shaped thing. That's your thyroid. Then attached to the very front edge of the, of the thyroid is the parathyroid gland, which is about the size of a pinhead or a little bit bigger, and it's white. So you can see this little white dot on the green thing. So when you remove the green thing, you want to leave the white dot behind. And yes, there is a second parathyroid associated with each of the thyroids, but that's inside the thyroid, so we can't preserve that. That's forfeited when we take the thyroid away. But you absolutely must leave the parathyroids behind and you must not damage them during the surgery. The job of the parathyroids, also in simplistic terms, is to control the calcium levels in your body. And one of the important functions of calcium in your body is to control the, uh, your, your, your nerves, to control how your nerves function. If your, if your calcium level is, no, is low, your nerves become a bit twitchy and they fire off spontaneously and very easily. Um, uh, um, and that can lead to tremors, convulsions, and even seizures. The most common version of that we're familiar with is uh, eclampsia or milk fever, and that happens in human beings and in animals. And that's because the, the calcium is being drained out of your body. It's going into the boobs to get ready to go into your baby, and that can leave your own body with too low a blood level of calcium, and you will start to get sort of the jitters, uh, 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 and that's a bit, that's a problem, that's, that can be life-threatening, so that needs to be addressed. So it is absolutely essential when we do the thyroid surgery that we leave these parathyroids behind. It's sometimes easier said than done. I always say to people, imagine the, the parathyroid, the little white dot on the, on the bigger green thyroid, Imagine it's, it's, it's got the consistency of jelly. Uh, it just, it's just very, it's very fragile. And if you start to pull it and, 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 and handle it, it tends to want to just disintegrate into mush. So the idea is to just, if you imagine that's the thyroid or the little parathyroid sitting on top of it, you want to just get under it and just tease it off with an instrument. So you just sort of tease it off without actually grabbing it and pulling it off. And again, that's sometimes easier than said, said than done because although some of them are very loosely attached to the thyroid, they, they shell off quite nicely. Others are really stuck fast. And, and that's, that's, that's a technically demanding thing to do is to get this tiny little mushy blob to come off without, without hurting it. Um, you realistically only need one parathyroid. So, so you've got sort of one on either side. If you can preserve at least one, you should be fine. E but even in those cases, in the immediate post-op period, you may go through a temporary phase of just low calcium levels. So it's essential that you monitor these cats for about 24 not 24, uh, uh, three, to f three to seven days, I would say, post-surgery to look for signs of jittering and twitching. It probably often starts with facial itching, so you see them rubbing their faces a lot, then you get this jittering, and then you can progress to seizures. Trick is, get them to your vet, get it checked, get that addressed. So the surgery is a funky one, because the, f the immediate question you would ask, well, hang on, if you've got an enlarged thyroid on both sides, and you remove both of them, and yes, you leave your parathyroid behind, how is that cat now fine? How are they not hypothyroid, meaning, they've got no thyroid left at all because they're not producing any thyroid. And what we think happens in these guys is they, had, they have thyroid-like tissue, so thyroid-like tissue uh, dotted around in little clumps of cells within their, their chest spaces. Uh, and these, I think of them as stem cells that want to be thyroid cells that have only sort of half woken up and half started doing that job. And they are obviously not in a normal place because normally it's here. So it's stem cells that want to be 
thyroid cells that are half awake. So when you remove these thyroids and the body is calling out, well, hang on, where's my thyroid hormone now? These little dotted um, clusters of cells inside of your chest will wake up and start to produce thyroid hormone uh, and that will be adequate for your body, which is terrific. I've, I think I've only seen one case in my hands that's gone to surgery, had both thyroids removed and have then become hypothyroid, underactive. So we actually have to supplement their thyroid hormone. So we've swapped one problem for another, but I'd rather be hypo than hyperthyroid because the hypothyroid uh, leaves you feeling much more unwell and it's got the risk of blindness and so on um, that we discussed. So this thyroid-like tissue dotted around in the, in the chest cavity, this all wakes up and then uh, it takes over and you live uh, happily ever after. So that's the surgical option. Um, then what came along a few years ago was, uh, I think it's just, just Hills, the big food company manufacturer. It. They produce a diet called the YD diet, which effectively is uh, a diet with, with um, extremely low levels of iodine uh, in it. Why is that relevant? Because your, your thyroid uses iodine to make the thyroid hormone. Uh, it's the only thing in your body that uses iodine, and it's the only thing that's made from iodine is the thyroid hormone. So the premise being, if we give you just a tiny, tiny little bit of thyroid, then you can only make a tiny bit of thyroid hormone. So even though your thyroid gland is overactive, you are hyperthyroid, even though it's overactive, it can't make too much thyroid because we're just not giving it the building blocks to do so. So that's, that's a very elegant solution um, on paper. Uh, it's obviously only practical if you have a cat where you can ensure that they eat that food only. If you, if you have a cat who goes outside and may eat uh, some poor victim that it murders out, out, outdoors, or it steals the neighbor's cat's food, or it has any, any, any access to any food anywhere else, like your dog's food, for example, then that is not going to work for them because you haven't restricted their, their iodine intake. And even in multi-cat households, it's a hell of a thing to try to manage uh, you know, each cat's diet and make sure that your, that your overactive thyroid cat doesn't nick anyone else's food. But if, for argument's sake, you were living in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an apartment or a flat somewhere, your cat didn't, didn't go out at all, and you only had one cat, then that's potentially an elegant solution to your problem. So it's to feed an iodine-restricted uh, diet. Uh, and then the final option is, 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 has become really the gold standard. It's become, if you could choose, it's the one you'd want to do, which is um, um, radioactive iodine treatment. So effectively, what we do is we feed the cat um, uh, iodine, which is which has been made radioactive, uh, and so they take it in, they eat it up, and it goes, uh, it goes in, a, in a tablet, uh, it goes into their body, and... Um, Again, the thyroid is the only organ in the body that uses iodine, and it sort of concentrates all the iodine in the thyroid gland uh, to get it ready to make thyroid hormone. But because it's radioactive, um, you get this sort of local radioactive frying, if you like, of the overactive thyroid tissue, and it damages the thyroid tissue to the extent where it can't be overactive anymore. And the reason I think it's become the gold standard is it addresses not just this thyroid tissue in the obvious thyroids in the neck, but remember we spoke about the thyroid-like tissue and the rest of the, uh, that can be hiding in the chest. Um, um, the, the, this will also absorb the iodine because it wants to, uh, wants to make thyroid hormone of itself, these abnormal clusters of cells or these um, anomalous cluster of cells, uh, and that will fry them too. And, that, and the idea is just to fry them enough to stop them from being overactive. Um, that Generally, these cats have to be hospitalized for a week or two, because remember that while they're taking in the radioactive material, uh, their urine in their feces is potentially hazardous, and so that has to be managed uh, in, a, in a safe and uh, sensible way. So that has to be done somewhere uh, at a veterinary practice that handles that kind of thing. So that's become the gold standard. I'm not convinced that any one treatment is better than, than the other. We have to sort of weigh up uh, uh, one thing against the other and we have to sort of stage our patients. So oftentimes if we, if we took, for example, the surgical option, we wouldn't necessarily want to charge straight into the surgery because if we go in and remove those thyroid hormones and then we find that your thyroid level has dipped below normal and your kidney uh, um, uh, uh, chemistries have, have crept up, telling us that the kidneys are now in failure, then we can't undo the fact that we've taken the thyroids away. Whereas if we've done something like uh, the medications, then we can say, well, oh, actually, let's just undo that a little bit. We just, we just reduce our medications, lift your thyroid back into the normal range, and then even if your kidney enzymes don't come down, even if they stay up, uh, you're still fine. You're still going to live as long as well and healthy as someone whose kidney enzymes hadn't crept up. And remember, the creeping up of the kidney enzymes is indicative of kidney failure, uh, but don't read too much into the word failure. Failure means the kidneys are just not doing the job 
that they were meant to do as well as they were meant to do it. It's not the same as complete kidney collapse. So I think we're all, as human beings, once you're over the age of about 60 years old, we're all in some degree of kidney failure, meaning the kidneys are failing to do their job as well as they were. That's why you've got to get up and wee at night because you're not recycling water as well as you should. But that's not the same as catastrophic, complete, uh, uh, irre irre uh, irrecoverable kidney failure. So, so, so just, just take the term with a pinch of salt. Uh, when we use it in this context, we're talking about that slow deterioration of function. So to sum up, these cats, um, it's an extremely common condition. Uh, so if you've got an elderly cat who's skinny, losing weight, seems agitated, seems, uh, seems a bit vomity, uh, uh, um, but the hallmark is this massive appetite, we absolutely want to do something for them. It's a horrible way to live. It's a very, very miserable way to live. You run the risk of uh, irreversible blindness. Uh, and for the sake of very little effort, we can hugely improve their quality of life and indeed extend their lives. Uh, and I think we, we owe it to them. If we take these guys on into our care, then really we should be helping them, particularly with something so prevalent. So I hope that makes uh, sense to everyone. Um, and thank you again for tuning in to the Nico uh, the Vet channel on YouTube. Thank you as always to everyone who's written in with their kind comments and please keep them coming. Let me know if there are any other topics that you would like me to address. Uh, take care. Bye-bye.